Adrian N. Breitfelder, City Clerk, you are hereby directed to call a special session of the City Council to be held on Monday, May 15th, 2023 at 5 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting work sessions on a Brownfield site conceptual re revisioning plan and the Flock Safety Automated License Plate Reader System. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to a special session of the Dubuque City Council for May 15th, 2023. As a reminder to viewers and listeners, due to the nature of tonight's meeting topic, public input is not accepted. However, you may contact the City Council directly from the City's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Kavanaugh? Here. Council Members Farber? Here. Jones? Here. Resnick? Here. Roussel? Here. Sprank? Here. Wethel? Here. City Manager Van Milligan? Here. And City Attorney Brumwell? Here. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Uh, Jeremy Jensen, Chief of Police. Tonight we're going to be presenting to you on uh, what an automatic license plate reader system looks like, com complete automated license plate reader system. Uh, we have a representative from Flock Safety here that's going to be presenting to you, so I'm going to let him do all the talking. I'll let him introduce himself, and we'll go from there, and then I'll be available for questions after that. So let me go ahead and start off by providing you all with a little bit of information on Flock Safety. Um, we are an Atlanta-based company. We were founded when our CEO and his neighbors were victims of multiple crimes. Um, they had a rash of burglaries, car breakings, among, amongst other crimes. And just like many of you all, uh, they had ring cameras, other uh, video footage, um, which they provided to police. Um, but what they realized is that that wasn't enough to help their crimes be solved. Police let them know that a license plate is actually what they would have needed to solve uh, these type of crimes. And so he set out to investigate or research um, license plate reading cameras. And what he noticed was that they were extremely expensive, tens of thousands of dollars per year per camera, and also uh, did not uh, take ethics or have ethics in the, in, you know, at the core of what they did. And so a lot of times uh, companies that, that were providing LPR uh, cameras to cities would also sell uh, footage. So what he did is uh, create a uh, software as a service type of model in which we uh, provide uh, you know, the cameras for the city. We own them, we, we install them, but we own them. Um, and then we also maintain them. And so that's really how we got started in order to help uh, local law enforcement solve crime. Next slide. Um, we should be at the slide right after why block safety, um, which states what we observe and the current reality. So as, as you all um, kind of heard from that story, but these neighbors realize is that um, police have limited resources, right? And you need, uh, technology can serve as a force multiplier. Um, and we need to provide police with the ability um, with objective evidence uh, to the right users and provide ways in which the community can support uh, their local law enforcement. Next slide. So how does this technology work? Next slide. So you should be seeing the slide that says when you get flock, flock you get. And on the top right hand corner, you see what actual footage looks like. It is the back of a vehicle and a license plate. It is not people, it is not facial recognition, and it is not child. It does, however, allow your police department to search by different uh, criteria or different filters such as make and color. Next slide. So what is this technology? What is this technology? It's not tied to personal identifiable information in that Flock does not contain any DMV records. We are providing a, a, a lead into a vehicle that matches a description or is on a wanted list. The data is not stored beyond 30 days and it is automatically deleted at that point. This helps police be able to research crime uh, or investigate any crimes that take place even if somebody's out on vacation for a couple of weeks, for example, but it's not long-term retention of data. Next slide. So how does this technology prevent and eliminate crime? There's three different aspects to this technology. It's proactive in that your police department will receive real-time alerts in their vehicle within 20 seconds, anytime that a stolen vehicle passes by or any other wanted reasons in NCIC, which is a national database. It's investigative in that pol your police department will be able to investigate and follow up on crimes that occur. And this is important because as clearance rates increase, crime rates decrease, which this means is that in any given month, um, you'll have, you know, 
let's say 20 burglaries in your city, that doesn't mean that there's 20 different individuals committing these crimes. There may just be a couple, and it's important to be able to get catch them on the first or second attempt in order to prevent those additional crimes. The flock cameras also act as a deterrent. Word gets out that your community is protected by these cameras, um, and it, it'll serve as a, as, as a deterrent in that way. And the next slide, mitigating risk, and continue on again to the slide that says ethics-driven innovation, protecting privacy. As I mentioned in the beginning, um, when our CEO founded our company, he really noticed that you know ALPR had been around for a very long time. Um, it's, it was extremely expensive, as I mentioned, tens of thousands of dollars. You were purchasing a camera, but also you know ethics wasn't in the in, at the heart of what these companies were doing. And so, with us, the footage is owned by your city and will never be sold or shared by Flock. Your police department is the only one that can uh, share that data within the system for legal law enforcement purposes. This is also taking out the human bias out of crime solving um, by providing your department with objective information on objectively illegal events, such as stolen vehicles. All of the data is stored in AWS government cloud. It's end-to-end -end encrypted. This is the highest level of encryption um, all of these servers are located uh, completely within the United States. And th there's a search reason required with an audit trail capability. It's also important to mention, and I believe it may be in your packet, that you know, the, your police department's policy is going to require a case number or a reference number. As I mentioned earlier, there's no personal identifiable information within Flock. Therefore, it also means that there's no traffic enforcement that can be um, these cameras can be used for. Next slide. Um, there's a couple sample policies that may be in this, um, but um, uh, if you can go to uh, one more slide to the transparency and insights slide. Um, Flock has a unique uh, transparency page. It's uh, the only one, one of its kind in the industry. And what it will allow your residents to do is that we'll create a web page for your police departments, which they, which they can put on their city website or on social media, or any resident can access the policy, what your police department is using the information for, as well as who they're sharing with, how many searches they're performing, et cetera. So a really good way for folks to have insight into the work being done. Next slide. So it's actually solving and preventing crime. Next slide. It's actually widely adopted in your state and in the surrounding areas. As you can see here, um, a really good amount of cities in Iowa, as well as in Illinois, um, very extensive network in the Chicago metro area. There's over 200 uh, police departments using Flock in Illinois specifically, over 1,400 nationwide, which is um, part of the network that your department will be able to uh, tap into. Next slide. Closer to home, I wanted to just highlight some of the success that um, Urbandale had. Um, they installed 13 cameras, and within their first month, they had eight arrests that they tied to these cameras, and it assisted police in finding a wanted suspect with outstanding warrants in their city. Next slide. And it's a no-brainer that these cameras will be helping solve uh, stolen vehicle cases, um, but they really can be preventative. Um, in San Bruno, California, uh, that you may have seen this actually, uh, you know, in hit national headlines. Uh, there was a smash and grab attempt uh, where you know they there was armed security in the store, so he was able to fend off um, those would be thieves. What the police department, however, believes would happen is that they would return and escalate their level of violence. So what they did is that they put a custom hot list on that vehicle. When those folks came back. Uh, into uh, the the shopping center where the where the store was located, the police was able to stop them from going in and stop them from escalating in their level of violence. And then the next slide, what you're seeing in front of you is an Amber Alert. What Flock and Safety has actually helped win over a hundred cases missing people's cases. This is a very compelling story here out of Chambly, Georgia. It's a stranger on stranger abduction, which is extremely rare. The mother that you see on your screen was pushing her baby, who you also see, in his stroller when two masked and armed individuals came up to her, fought her, and took her child away. She had no idea who these people were, and she actually did not get a license plate. But she did see the vehicle and provided that description to local law enforcement. Local law enforcement then issued an Amber Alert, 
and conducted a search within Flock. They then found a suspect vehicle and made a felony stop and arrest uh, within six hours, right? So from 12 to 6 p.m., they were able to do this. They made that um, stop in Alabama one state <laughs> over. These folks wanted to raise a child as their own, and luckily that was stopped. In these type of cases, you know, you really need to have um, this type of technology to, to, to help find a, uh, a solution quickly, and they're uh, behind bars today. Next slide. You should be seeing a slide with different setups of the cameras. As I mentioned at the beginning, our, um, you know, we are a software as a service model. It is infrastructure free. Um, we will work with your police department to identify locations. Um, and these are some of the examples that, of, of how we will install them, whether it's on existing poles, um, traffic poles, or on our standalone flock poles. And then um, last slide, would love to open it up for any questions. I know I did a lot of talking at you all. Um, but happy to dive in and answer any questions that you may have. Excellent. Hector, well, thank you very much. We appreciate that uh, presentation. So we'll turn it over here to the council for any questions. Chief, is there anything you wanted to add before we do that? or we... Just one quick thing. So you mentioned about 200 agencies in, in um, Illinois. There's also, talking to Hector before this, and represented 100 agencies in Wisconsin that are the same, that are on the same system. Got it. Thank you very much. All right. Questions from council? Mr. Resnick. Thank you. I have a page full, so don't hesitate to uh, interrupt me and get some other questions. But So uh, my question, so the, uh, the company doesn't own the data, but who requires us to have a 30-day storage? There, there is no requirement for a 30-day storage. Um, there's actually, across the country, um, kind of different laws there. New Jersey, for example, has 90-day retention requirements. Other states have much shorter. Um, we've been really consistent there, though, think with the 30 days, because what we see is that that's enough time for your police department to investigate crime, but also protects privacy, right? So at that 30-day mark, the, uh, uh, the footage is hard deleted. It, ha it has what it's called a time to live stamp on it. So 30 days after that image is taken, it is deleted and is no longer retrievable. Um, so enough time to investigate crime, but also want to protect privacy. Okay, thank you. And uh, citizens have asked me, and, and people ask, why are we saving the data uh, on law-abiding citizens when 99.9% .9 of the licenses are law-abiding citizens, and yet uh, we are, we're going to be saving that data? Uh, if it doesn't ding, I mean, what I understand is if a license comes up that's on, on the hot list, that you're going to be notified. Why does it have to be more than a day that we store that because um, I mean either you're identified as someone who needs to be identified or not so I guess that's a question that I have um, yeah and, and that's an excellent question it definitely comes up and and I could um, let the chief um, kind of expand on my answer but um, as I was trying to or was saying earlier this provides an investigative tool many times um, crimes are not reported right away Folks are out on vacation, for example, for a couple of weeks, they come home, they notice that things may be missing, right? So it gives police enough time to be able to investigate. But again, the 30 days makes it so that it's a short retention period. And at that point, everything is deleted. So it's really balancing that ability to research and investigate crimes with, um, you know, uh, police bandwidth, and then of course, protecting privacy. Um, and it's also important to mention, as I said um, during the presentation, there's no personal identifiable information within Flock. So that footage that you saw, it's an image of the back of the vehicle and the metadata associated with the vehicle. No DMV records or anything tying it to a resident, um, you know, saying John Smith is in this vehicle, for example. Um, it's really just a vehicle information. Back in 2018, the Supreme Court said that police have to get a warrant before they obtain historical information from cell phone providers about the location. So um, it's reason that the depth, breadth, and comprehensive reach of this data uh, is just because you're carrying a cell phone doesn't mean people can track you. And if, and if you want to know, you know what they were doing two weeks ago, you have to have uh, a warrant supported by probable cause. How far are we going to ask? Are we ever going to go for that within those 30 days? Um, uh, are we going to ask for that? License plates are plain view, so they're public. Um, that's the difference between a cell phone and a, and a license plate. A license plate, you can drive down the street and see anybody's license plate that you, 
and there it is. That's plain view, public, you can see that. I don't see what's in your cell phone. That's why they, the Supreme Court has ruled that cell phones have a lot more privacy to them because I'm looking into your life essentially with that. This is just reading the license plate. Uh, and I expand upon the question about why we'd want it more than a day because we only know what we know. If we don't know somebody committed a crime, and as the example some of our investigators gave you, some of that's two, three, four days, two weeks old. Um, somebody committed a crime and we're going back to try to figure out who they are. Um, you know, if we lost the data because we only kept it a day, um, it'd be useless to us and we wouldn't be able to solve that. So that's, well, that's why there is. Our current system keeps them for about 30 days um, and we, we can definitely write that into the policy um, with this. So to have that, but to be able to just to essentially real time and not store it, it it's not going to help us investigative wise because this is all reactive. It's not a lot of proactive side to this where we're chasing things down uh, because we think this is going to happen. This is like trying to solve crimes for people. Okay, thank you. And I'm concerned about the sharing. It mentioned that the company doesn't share, but we have a choice of sharing. And um, so, I mean, w w with the laws nowadays, you can, do we share with other states? Other states have different laws. Uh, if, you're, if you have a health clinic, you can't go to a health clinic for certain reasons. Uh, for certain state laws, and yet, can we track those people, or do we do we have a commitment to say uh, any state w wants to know? You know, we have new people coming to our uh, state, and they see that they're coming into Dubuque. Do we have to um, do we uh, cooperate with everyone who has um, say uh, U.S. Immigrations and Customs Enforcement if they ask for uh, the uh, license data? coming in and we get a ping that some other state has put this information and they're looking for this information or this, this car because of these laws that we don't have in Iowa. How do we deal with that? Well, this would be if they were looking for like a warrant. So somebody would have a warrant. So they'd have a lawful arrest issued by a judge. Um, not that we're chasing people to enforce other state laws. So, um, you know, pick a state that has window tint that's legal and they could say, hey, we know they're coming out of Iowa, can you track it? We're not gonna do that. Um, much like we didn't do, use the cameras to track people for mask usage during COVID. We didn't do that. And what we did is we focused on the, um, on our law enforcement side, the uh, major crimes, and that's what we're really looking at doing this. And, and like I said, as we presented, it's really just about time for us. Thank you. And one more, Mr. Mayor, before break, because uh, the gentleman talked about Fajeo, California, and I have a little thing about Fajeo too, and, and they said that, uh, the, the randomized controlled trial in Vajeo, California, found that 37% of all the ALPR hits from fixed readers and 35% from mobile readers uh, were an error for some reason. Either the hit list was wrong or not updated, or the numbers were uh, misread, and there were a lot of problems uh, from that. Because obviously, with that kind of uh, data, uh, problem. Do you have a national, sir, do you have a, a, a data reliability figure for us? Yeah, so the, the numbers that were quoted there were actually from Vallejo, California, before they were flock customers. They they um, used a different system. Um, and so I think they're from about 2017 or 2018. Um, we provide a probability percentage on every single uh, search result. And so the way that that works is that it will let your police officers know, hey, this is a 98% accurate or 96, 97. And if it falls below 90%, it'll have a warning triangle, letting them know that the, um, the you know, it, it's not as confident of a read. That helps ensure that there's different, you know, uh, thing, uh, uh, time frames, et cetera, uh, speeds that may impact a, a read. But the other side of it, and I believe the chief may have shared your policy, is that it does, you are required to verify every single alert uh, via policy, right? And so um, it is machine learning. So you do need to have as part of your policy something that states, okay, I, what, it, what, the, what the block system is telling me and what my eyes are seeing are the same thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sprank. Mr. Mayor. Uh, two questions, Chief. The first one would be, uh, my company put up security cameras. We hold them for 90 days, or sorry, take that back, 30 days, because we opted down because we didn't need that long. How much, so if you walk into Hy-Vee, Menards, Lowe's, 
ballpark? How long they how long do they keep their data for? It, it just depends on the company. So if we walk in and say, do you have it? And they say, yeah, we keep it 30 days, we keep it six weeks, we keep it 90 days, we keep it two days. It just depends on the company. Right. And then I guess we're, we've talked about traffic cameras as well, or speed enforcement cameras. Would we have to put up signage for these? Like to say this is a flock monitoring area, or does that basically... No, we don't have to, but this is one of the things I think, you know, it's a deterrent. As, as Hector talked about, this is a deterrent. We would advertise we have this. I mean, we want people to know that if you're going to come here and commit crime, you're going to get caught. And that's, that would be our goal. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, Mr. Farber. So um, just a couple of questions, um, and thank you very much for the information about how proactive this system is, especially with the um, stolen and wanted vehicles. And most importantly, for those amber alerts, I think that example was quite exemplary uh, and, and just a thing that we should take note of in case that does happen here. I think that's a great result. Um, regarding the transparency portal, and you had talked about you have AWS backup, et cetera, how would you or how would I access that transparency board portal if I went on to the site that you listed uh, on the police beat? So Flock Safety would create the page, provide that link to your department. Um, they can put it directly in, in on their city website, or they can put it on social media. Um, different departments do it different ways. They sometimes will create an entire transparency page. Um, so we leave it up to them. Uh, you can also, uh, if that page is live, Google uh, Dubuque uh, Flock Safety Transparency, and it'll come up that way as well. How do you prevent people from interfering with police work, though? So all of the information in there um, is is kind of is is public, right? So it's just how many cameras do they have, and your department will choose. They can they can actually choose what they put on there. But it's hey, what's the policy? A short summary of why are we why is our department using these cameras? Who are they sharing with? How many hot list alerts they're getting? So really, more um, like return on investment an insight into the work that they're doing, but there's no specific, hey, these are the cases that they're looking at, these are the criteria that they're searching. That still um, remains um, private due to you know them that being part of an investigation. Except for perhaps the Amber Alerts, how does that get handled? So the Am Amber Alerts, we will notify the police department of any alerts, just like they would of any stolen vehicles. So they will be provided with those alerts. Um, and MAYAC, which is the organization that, that manages that, also, you know, as you, most folks uh, have probably experienced, you'll still be receiving Amber Alerts on your via text, et cetera. Um, but this is providing it directly to police within their squad cars. Okay. And then one last question that we had talked about previously was, could you explain to us if someone is actually um, picked up due to a, a warrant for a stolen or wanted vehicle or the Amber Alert, how that database is managed and how that is stored and how long do you store that versus the 30-day turnover? So if somebody actually commits a so, crime, uh, go ahead, Hector, you go first. Yeah, so I was just going to speak to the, the actual list and how we um, ping that. That list is um, kept by uh, uh, state agencies and the federal government. Um, we ping it eight times a day. I believe it is um, updated eight, uh, four times a day. So we just try to make sure that we always have the, the most current list mm -hmm. and we pull directly from there. Um, your department then verifies those alerts and then um, I believe the chief was going to kind of answer that second part of that question. Yeah, so then there's, so the state runs the system, state has its own requirements for that, but if we actually arrest somebody, now you're running into the actual arrest in the public records law and what goes with an arrest or um, police reports and that kind of stuff. Okay, so the public records law would determine the length of stay, obviously, for historical and other yeah, reasons. Yes, for arrest and for Correct. police records and that, yeah, all that. Right, and wouldn't it be interesting statistically to see how that would work for the city of Dubuque and how many cases we help solve going forward if this were to um, be something that we actually do? Yes, correct, and, and that's something we, we would do. We would track this as part of our, our other system. That's one thing we're starting to track is how many, as you saw, you see that we put that out whenever we solve a case using the camera, but we're also, well, when we put it out publicly, I mean, like I told you and like our investigator said, they're using them all the time. So we're using them on all these cases, but definitely with this. Um, and and uh, we would publicize, you know, how much that it actually is working or not working. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much.
Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones. I understand part of the system is crowdsourced information where other flock subscribers might get a ping on a Dubuque wanted and then you would get word on that that it's in going down Interstate 80 in Colorado or something. Is that correct? Yeah, I'll, I'll let Hector explain that, how that works. Yeah, it, it's it's not crowdsourced in that any individual can provide information. Right. Um, only other law enforcement agencies. So there's the national databases for the hot list. Um, that is, um, you know, vetted, and those are vehicles that are, are known to be wanted. Um, police departments can collaborate with each other uh, and share a custom hot list uh, that that may be of interest in your region. For example, your department still has to accept that hot list. They don't have to you know, carte blanche accepted. So they would still have the ability to decide whether that's something that they want to follow up on or not. Um, but that's definitely a way that police departments will collaborate with each other. I can give you an example here in California, um, two adjacent communities. They know that many times if the vehicle is going north, it's going to be um, going to that other community. So they'll share a hot list proactively that way. Um, but but that's I, that, that's the collaborative portion, but nothing that's crowdsourced per se, where and you know any resident can provide data. And that's all permission based, correct, Hector? Correct. So you're you as um, the chief or other administrators have the ability to accept um, you know following up on any uh, custom hot list as, as well as other departments if you share any with them. And as far as uh, retention, obviously, if you've got an active crime investigation, you're going to retain those records separately and locally and securely as part of the investigative package. Yeah, at that point, it becomes evidence. And so we start saving things that way. Sure. But Joe Blow going to Walmart is going to be gone in 30 days. Yep. <laughs> okay, thank you. Ms. Wethel. So just a couple of questions um, for both Chief Jensen and, and Hector. So the um, question I have is specifically, now I know we have the ability to draft an amendment to the current ordinance as it relates to speed cameras, but in your vision, who in our city specifically would have access to run a query on the flock cameras? And that's, so we have law enforcement as part of that. So as we look into it, and we haven't got into that, but who the administrators of the system are, obviously there's different levels, you know, that you can query into a system, and, I can, and Hector can explain that, that a little bit better. But as you get into it, and then, as I said, the review, the audit, who's doing what and how it is. Same thing now. So NCIC already has an audit. So if we run it, an officer sits in their car and runs license plates, all the time, it's still being audited. That the state is looking at it and saying, hey, you, you had this. Why did this get, you know, and sometimes you get queries. Why did this same plate get run 15 times like that? Or um, we can go back and see what officers are running for the plates. And so uh, the same thing is that how we envision that is we want to have officers have access, you know, in real time, because that's what we're talking here. We're talking about saving time, but also that ability to have the transparency and have the audit ability. Just to expand on that a little bit, though, um, it would not be accessible, I just want to confirm this, to other city employees who do not have a law enforcement background. So I just want to be clear to citizens that I, as a city councilwoman, would not have access to the FLAC system, nor would anyone um, who is not involved in the law enforcement department. Yeah, and that's correct. So NCIC itself now, because we have to test, we have to test into that. We, it is protected. Not anybody can look at it. We have to protect the view of it. So there's uh, similarities within that. Okay. And then Chief, if you would also share, because I think it's very helpful, um, how you became aware of the flock system in the example that you have provided previously. Sure. So, uh, we didn't know the flock system existed. And one day we got a call from Shreveport, Louisiana that said, hey, uh, when, a, when a vehicle associated with a murder suspect just pinged off your camera in your town. Now we don't have this. We're like, what the heck? Um, and so we figured it out and found out that it was a, um, a semi going through this a flock camera was attached to a semi and actually read the plate that, of this license plate associated with a murder suspect. So then we were able to go back and use our cameras, track the person around, good police work, found out where the car was at in town, 
you know, sat on it, did our police things, and ended up getting the guy that was wanted on the murder. And, and so that's how we became aware of the system to begin with. Thank you. Mr. Mayor. Yeah, Mr. Jones. That's kind of what I was referring to in the crowdsourcing. This, the semi had a camera in it. Now, that, that truck driver had no idea that this was happening, right? Nope. Just driving a truck. Nope. Just driving the truck, and it just happened to be a part of the equipment on the truck. So um, I have a couple questions for you. Um, I want to follow up on a question that Ms. Wethel just asked, though. You said no other city employees. Are there times where, like, I mean, we have an IT department. We have an engineering department that helps with our current cameras right now. Is there any sort of overlap within city departments that would be helping the police department to, to do this uh, and, and uh, put the system in place and that kind of thing? Under the current system, so engineering helps us with that and dispatch. Um, so like, like this, dispatch would get the alerts mm -hmm. too. So dispatch gets the alerts, the officers get the alerts, not just going to an officer. Um, same way NCIC does. We may have to have IT help us with things, but there is that, again, the confidentiality part of that. They're not going to be getting the data. Mm -hmm. What they'll be doing is helping us make sure the system runs, again, um, within our network. Sure. Okay. Hector, I'll, I'll ask that same question to you real quick. It, the, is that kind of the way it works in other cities in the, when you have that system in place, too, that there's some departmental overlap for reasons of technology and that type of thing? Yeah, so typically it's going to be sworn officers that will have access. Um, you can create different w w user roles, um, and sometimes IT, depending if they're you know kind of embedded within the police department, will have some kind of access. Uh, but you know, for sieges data, so hot list alerts, etc., that's going to be dispatch that will be able to receive alerts. Um, detectives may have more access, right, to search, lookup tool, um, but but that'll be determined by the police department and their policies. Um, but, but no, usually anybody, it'll be sworn officers or folks that are already CGIS certified. Understood. Thank you very much. Um, Chief, going back to the error piece of this uh, and verifying, you know, because the, you know, technology is not perfect. Sometimes it's going to screw up. I was very interested to hear, Hector, that you have this system that sort of flags the things that might not be as accurate for whatever reason. The, the verification piece of this, how, you know, how, you described it a little bit, but essentially, are you going to be verifying, is an officer going to be verifying every single time that we hear this plate? We're not just going to get a, a read off the hot list and then the officer just starts chasing down whatever well, car or whatever it was. Let me put it this way. They better because that's part of what we do. Gotcha. I mean, we need to verify. So that's probable cause. So if we get a hit and it's a partial license plate, like we do now, say we had the same thing, we had a partial, we still need to match some things up. You know, if we, we start looking, so say if it's a wanted person in the car, Right? So we get the car. Does the car match the license plates? Let's start with there. And if it doesn't, let's start asking other questions. Maybe there's a reason, but maybe it's not accurately acting, matching up. On top of it, if we got a wanted person, um, if we can get the description off the wanted uh, side of that to say, does that match the person in the car, at least to some degree? And so that's the checks and balances. So it still requires an officer to do that. You still have to have that human side to this. It's not automatically go arrest this person on this. We still have to make sure, and we have to make sure we're doing that. And, and we do that with, with everything we do. We have to make sure we have all these steps in it in, in matches. Gotcha. Thank you. A um, couple more quick ones here, and then I'd, I'd like us to wrap up around 625, just for everybody's awareness. So Mr. Resnick, I know you have another list of questions, so we can get to as many as possible. Um, first question here, the, the auditing piece of this. So Hector, back to you. This actually is set up to easily be able to audit the system and, and see who's pulling what and when and why and all these different things, your system is set up for that? Yeah, so every single time that a search is performed, an officer will have to enter in a search reason. Your policy is um, going to state that that's a case number. So every search will be logged, what filters they looked for. Your chief and, and other designees at the administrative level will pre periodically audit the system. And so what they'll do typically is say, let's say, and, and the chief can kind of expand on what their thoughts are um, at your department, but typically it'll be like, we're gonna take an, a sample size and go through case numbers and do, do the type of searches or filters that they use match what they should have been looking for in that case number, right? That case number XYZ was for a Ford, uh, white Ford, right? And so do those filters match? And so they'll be able to um, verify that way. The audit is available forever and never deletes, and so they'll be able to go back in time as well if there's any kind of report. 
Great, thank you, that's very helpful. And then I wanna make sure we answer this question before we leave here, and then I'll open it up for any other questions, but um, what, can, what can we as a city council and what can the community expect in terms of next spe steps in this process? We've had, I, I found this to be a very informative discussion, so Hector, thank you very much, and, and Chief. Um, this is very useful in ga gathering all this information. We're introducing a lot of this, you know, for the first time. What's, what's next here? What are we thinking? Next step would be to policy development and or, to tweak the policy we have to add on to it and, and work through that mm -hmm. um, to get that, um, to address all the issues that you have all brought up and on top of and within the system itself and then um, the user parameters. Gotcha. And I actually found it really helpful too that we had some other policies from other cities in the packet that we had here that everybody was able to see. So publicly you're able to look at that as well. Um, so thank you for answering that. Okay, Mr. Resnick. Thank you, three questions. Um, first of all, uh, the gentleman mentioned that uh, it lessens the, uh, perhaps the equity impact that we sometimes have. And I'm glad to hear that you're going to have these audit laws because this surveillance has historically in many places uh, disproportionately target community colors and, uh, and we want to have equal protection. And uh, with those audits, then uh, you can, uh, it should protect you against those disparate aspects, which I appreciate. But I, I do want to say that a couple things. First of all, uh, you don't think that it's a, a good um, analogy to compare phones and cars. But I think both of them, both of those uh, uh, smartphones and cars are absolutely essential. They're a requirement in a modern society. So people are forced to get in their cars and forced to go to places, and even if they want to have a, a private reserved life, they're out there. And, and this has become so automatic and so easy to do to, to accumulate this data that it's, it's not like somebody's just standing there and, and taking uh, you know, license plate numbers. It's, it's much more, it's much bigger. In fact, you just talked about lots of, uh, this is gonna be a nationwide uh, thing. Uh, the lots and lots of uh, people and communities are gonna be getting these cameras. So, and, there, and I also would say that there is a lot of personal information that is gathered when you see where people are, are going, what car they have and what, you know, whatever uh, color it is, but, and where they're going and what they're doing is very personal. Now you could shut your phone off and then you're, you're off of the, uh, the grid as far as that's concerned, but you can't shut your license plate off. I mean, you, you mentioned that, uh, or we saw how some people try to change license plates to uh, uh, disguise themselves. But I think it's very important to talk about uh, how long are we going to just keep these, and if these are citizens, 99.9%, .9%, as I said, are law-abiding citizens, how can we justify going back and doing a search on them if uh, without a warrant, without uh, some kind of specific uh, criteria. The other thing is that I guess that's a, just a question I'll throw out there because time's running out. Um, and, th and then the last thing is um, ab about the 30 days. So, um, and then finally, uh, I mentioned probable cause, which I think is very important. So all of those things, I think this is a, a great tool but I'm glad that you're really seriously thinking about what is our policy? What is the best for our citizens? I'm trying to think of the people who are gone and you have to, how, how are these cameras any better than the cameras we have now for something that happened three weeks ago? I mean, you're gonna, I mean, I'll let you have, why don't you answer that? How are these cameras better than the cameras we have for something that might've happened three weeks ago? So two weeks ago, investigator Schlosser gave you a presentation on a gun case, that's how. We, otherwise, we, they're not any better other than staffing. We would have to sit and watch a camera for 24-7 and watch multiple cameras to try to figure out which port of entry they come in on a date we don't know when they're coming back. So this is how that makes that much better. It also speeds up our investigation on the side if somebody takes off and they're gone out of town, we know they're out of town. So now we can alert other authorities and we're not looking around town. There's a public ease, right? The suspect's gone. They're not still in your neighborhood. They're, we know they're out of town. So we ha have that part of it, but also that we can, are actively using our other law enforcement agencies and our partners to try to solve this crime as quick as we can. And, and that's what it boils down to. That's what the cameras have gave us, and that's what the automated side will, gave us more speed in solving, uh, solving crimes. What automated side is even speed that up more. 
And, and that's, that's our goal, because our goal is to the victims. Our goal is to solve crimes as quick as we can and as accurately as we can. I appreciate this. I know we're going to talk about the policy a lot more uh, later. So uh, the mayor wants to end the meeting. I appreciate all your great answers. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Mr. Jones. Two quick points. Uh, the, just even uh, entering a license plate to, to do a license check, anybody can't do that. You have to be a sworn officer. You have to be trained and certified in, in all the applications. Um, as a firefighter, I couldn't do that if I had a vehicle that would need to move, and I had to find an officer to do that. And that's the way it should be. It protects it. It's very well locked down. The other point I'll just make quickly is uh, when automobiles became a thing in the early 1900s, state legislatures fairly quickly figured out that people are committing crimes with them, that people are harming others, and that we need to find a way to identify the owners of those vehicles. And so it's been law for 100 years or more that you have to have in Iowa a front and a rear license plate that tells law enforcement and anybody else who wants to go to the courthouse whose car that is and where they live. And it's been a matter of law for 100 years. And this is why. So that if you do something bad with your car, someone can get the tag number and report it and an arrest can be affected. Um, so the technology is catching up to, to what was a good idea 100 and some years ago, in my view. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. This has been a great discussion. I appreciate everybody's questions. And Hector, thank you very much for joining us this evening, giving us so much uh, information here. And, and you too, Chief. Thank you very much for being here. There being no further business in this work session, we will stand adjourned.